Hi guys, my name is Teo, and I'm a site reliability engineer on Google Maps. Now, I have two goals for this talk. The first one is for you guys to essentially understand what risky dependencies are and how they can have a pretty scary ramification for end users. Um, and the second goal is for you to understand how you can find them and then fix them before they cause a major serving outage for end users. All right. So let me share a little bit more about myself. So within Google Maps SRE, I work on a team called GeoData SRE. And we're essentially in charge of all of the systems that ingest, process, curate, and then store the data that powers Google Maps. Now, within GeoData SRE, I lead a program called Zero Outages. And the goal for this program is to categorically eliminate all major serving outages stemming from backends that we're on call for. And you know, that's a pretty crazy goal to achieve, and a lot of people gawk at that. Um, and I want to you know, show you how difficult that is. In 2020 alone, we were responsible for nine major serving outages impacting end users. And a subset of those major outages were due to risky dependencies that we were actually unaware of. So let me illustrate a little bit more. Earlier this year, I was looking into GPay's dependency on Google Maps data. Now, for those who don't know, Google Pay is a, a really important product for Google, and it's used by many people across the world, especially by those outside of the United States. Now, GPay has a transaction history page that's loaded up onto almost every Android phone, as well as every Android and iOS device that has the GPay app installed. Now, let's say I were to look at the uh, purchase that I made last December at Starbucks. When I click this particular transaction, GPay actually makes several backend calls to a Google Maps API to get merchant information like the name, Starbucks, as well as where it was located. Now, if you were designing this transaction history page, what would you look for in the reliability attributes for this backend API? Well, you know, we would want a few things. First, we would want many nines of reliability. We would want sufficiency, um, low latency. We would also want to make sure that the backend API is available wherever I operate. And I would also want to make sure that the data that this backend API serves is consistent and suitable for serving end users. So in short, I would want you know, a highly reliable and available backend. And that's pretty, you know, that's pretty intuitive. Now, What's really interesting about this particular case is that GPay actually used a backend API called the Canonical Store, which was meant for internal usage only. What does that mean? Well, the Canonical Store didn't have any of the requirements that I just described. And here's the kicker. The service owners of the Canonical Store weren't even aware that GPay depended on them. Now, when this risky dependency was added a few years ago, the canonical store became a critical backend for GPay. This is a huge risky dependency. And we don't necessarily know why the canonical store was chosen, but we can come up with some theories. You know, perhaps an alternative backend didn't exist at the time, or maybe the engineer who implemented this feature was much more familiar with the canonical store, and so they chose that over other suitable alternatives. Now, when we found this risky dependency, we were able to notify the owners of GPay and fix it within a month. Wow. So we were able to find and fix GPay's risky dependency on the canonical store. Now let's take a step back and actually understand how this data gets from the merchant to GPay. Well, at the very beginning, a merchant will give us some data via some sort of um, Google Business Profile application or the Merchant API. And this data that they give us, like the name or the office hours, um, gets queued up for moderation. right? So it, it waits in moderation for a certain amount of time. And then it passes moderation. And then it gets stored, curated inside of the canonical store. Now, the canonical storage layer's goal is really to be the source of truth, right? It doesn't care about serving data. What it cares about is being a repository for this data. And then it broadcasts that information to a replicated serving layer. Now, theoretically, only at this point is data available for end users via, say, GPay or Search.
I want to quickly clarify here that um, this diagram is an abstraction. So we have hundreds of pipelines and tons of APIs as well that actually power um, the Google Maps uh, you know, machine. And one request from the merchant can you know, go through 10 nodes, 10 hops, before it even hits moderation. All right. So in a perfect world, how much of this machine should actually be on the critical serving path for end users? Well, only a small part of it, right? Re remember that we care about moderating, curating, and storing data. And those steps shouldn't be on the critical path. End users shouldn't care about you know, how far we are in the storing of their data. What they care about is just giving us information, and then at a certain point, it will exist on Google Maps. Now, if we isolate these red boxes, we actually get a ton of gains. So firstly, there are reliability and monetary gains by reducing the serving layer. Because there are fewer parts that can break on the serving layer, we have higher performance of our system. Additionally, it becomes less expensive for SRE and SWEs. Now, by isolating these systems, they're then able to focus on their primary responsibility, like moderating or storing, as opposed to serving, which is not their primary responsibility. Cool. So in an ideal world, those red boxes are fully isolated from the end user path. But how isolated are they in reality? Well, what better way to investigate our assumption by looking at an outage? Several years ago, one of the data stores in the moderation system started experiencing thread contentions. Now, as a result of these thread contention errors, or as, as a result of these thread contentions, we started experiencing deadline exceeded errors within the moderation system itself. Now, because the moderation system is supposed to be isolated from end users via some sort of asynchronous queuing mechanism, we would expect that the impact of this be limited to only offline systems or human moderators. Right? Whoa. For some reason, as a result of these deadline exceeded errors, 1% of merchants were unable to edit their listing, and 12% of merchants were unable to even create a new listing in GBP. So for some reason, we thought that the moderation system was not on the critical path, and yet it was. GBP had a risky dependency on the moderation system, and this caused a major serving outage. What the heck? Why is it that we have so many risky dependencies in our system? Well, let me raise some hands here. How many of you guys know exactly which user journeys your service is responsible for? Raise of hands. All right, that's really small. OK, maybe five people. All right, I was expecting more. Um, how many of you guys know exactly which dependencies exist in your system? Raise of hands. OK, also a handful. Now, for those systems that you are on call for, how many of you guys review every change to production? OK, yeah, I was expecting, OK, one. Wow, very impressed. Um, now, for those of you guys who raised your hands for all three, I think that was like maybe one person. Um, could you say the same for the developers that are actually implementing this, these components in the system? Right, so no. You have to recall that we're working in a highly complicated system with hundreds of microservices. And the call stack can be 10 or more nodes deep. And service owners have a narrow and deep view of production. So they're familiar with their clients and their backends, but not necessarily who their transitive clients are. Compound that by the fact that communication across the entire stack is extremely difficult, and even more so when it crosses product boundaries. Now, on top of that, if that couldn't be you know, the worst possible thing, well, it gets even worse because some systems are legacy or unstaffed, and their current responsibilities may have outgrown their initial requirements. So as a result of all of this, service owners have a really you know, hard time understanding what production looks like. And therefore, system level views are scarce and outdated. And because of all of this, we have a really imperfect view of production. And now we're in a system that is ripe for risky dependencies to proliferate. Cool. So we understand what types of risky dependencies we're looking for, and we understand how they can have serious harm for end users. And we also understand what are the circumstances that lead us to get into this position. So how can we find them? 
Well, in theory, the goal is simple, right? Of all of the services which should be isolated from end users, how many of them are actually on the critical path? And we can answer that question in theory by essentially partitioning production into two sets. The first set is a set of services which should be isolated from end users. And the second set is a set of services which is actually external to end users. And then when you compare those two sets, you can actually discover all of the risky dependencies. So here we have three risky dependencies that violate the intent of internal services. Great. So in theory, this all makes sense. But when the rubber meets the road, how can we programmatically identify which services are actually on the end user path? And how can we determine which services are meant to be on that path versus actually isolated from that path? Well, if we integrate a monitoring tool like OpenTelemetry into our stack, then we can actually get a great deal of information with only a little bit of configuration. In particular, if we store and propagate who the original user of the RPC call stack was, so you know, in one uh, branch here, it is Google Frontend, and then in the other branch in gray, it is Node B, and we also store which service called us, the caller, and which service received the call, the service, then we actually have all of the information in order to solve this problem. So I'm going to go through the steps. We can aggregate this data in some sort of centralized repository, like a data lake. And then we can filter out um, to keep only the originators that we know faced the outside world for sure. So for Google, in this case, it would be something like a Google front end. Great. So now we have the set of dependencies which were on the critical path for end users, whether directly or indirectly. We can separately ask service owners to declare whether or not they even intend for their service to be on that critical path, and then merge this data together to get the set of dependencies that are risky, that essentially have dependencies where um, you know, the, the back end is on the critical path, but it's actually meant to be isolated. All right. So this was sort of like, you know, draw the first circle of the owl and then draw the rest of the owl, of course. There are some uh, abstractions there. Um, you can ask questions later. So now that we've found all of these risky dependencies, what can we do to fix them? Well, in our work at Google, we've found really three viable options to resolve these dependencies, each with varying degrees of effort and effectiveness. The first one is to migrate your um, risky backend to a less risky backend call. right? And this really works when you have two versions of the same API, one which is meant for end users and one which is meant to be isolated from end users. So a good example for that would be something like the canonical store, which is meant to be isolated, and the replicated serving layer, which was actually designed to serve end users. Now, if that first option isn't feasible, then you can actually investigate whether this backend call can be made optional. And this really means having some sort of graceful fallback mechanism for whenever that backend fails. And finally, which is, you know, we're ending up to the, the last option here, which we use least often, um, which would be to deprecate this dependency entirely and not replace it with anything else. And this is most common when we have backends that are legacy or frontends that are legacy. Awesome. So we've completed the full life cycle here. What are risky dependencies? What harm can they cause to end users? How we can find them and how we can fix them. Now let's turn our eyes back to GeoData and see what we discovered. By applying this methodology, we discovered that we had 10 systems that were not meant to be on the external path and over 23 client services that were sending us external traffic to these internal backends. Overall, we had 33 risky dependencies. These clients spanned search, ads, geo, and commerce. What the heck? Over the past year, we've worked with developer teams across these PAs to remove or reduce the impact of these risky dependencies. And because of this auditing tool, we feel so much more confident that our internal systems can focus on their primary responsibilities and move with more velocity while our remaining serving layer is smaller 
and more resilient than ever before. So to recap, some services that you own shouldn't be on the critical path for end users. But enforcing this becomes harder and harder as your system scales and the number of dependencies increases. Therefore, risky dependencies proliferate. But we can use horizontal and scalable monitoring tools like OpenTelemetry to find those risky dependencies and then fix them by applying engineering skills. And at the end of all of this, we're able to fix those risky dependencies before they cause a major serving outage, thereby improving the reliability of our serving layer. Now, as an aside, I want to note that this particular invariant is the one that I focused on today. But you can come up with many other invariants that you can check using um, open telemetry, such as, you know, this backend shouldn't handle PII, or this backend has sensitive information. So if there's one thing that you should remember from this talk, it's this. Start thinking about which services shouldn't be on the critical path, i.e., should be isolated from end users. And think about the benefits that you will reap once you ensure that they are fully isolated. So it's been a great honor to present in front of such an awesome group of engineers, um, and I look forward to answering your questions. <laughs>